committing a trillion dollars of infrastructure spending and more government spending on the horizon. Concerns are raised about supply and demand and higher prices for goods and services. Many people remain unsettled about the economy and we all know why. They see higher prices. They go to the store or go online and they can't find what they always want. Stress on the global supply chain has too many dollars chasing too few goods. When we look at the surge in demand that we've witnessed for goods over the course of this pandemic, that has just taken supply chains beyond the brink. And cryptocurrency's impact on helping COVID-shattered economies recover on the inside story, global pandemic economy. Hey. Hey. Hi, I'm Katherine Gibson, VOA Congressional Correspondent. Here in Washington, we just saw a rare moment of political bipartisanship when President Joe Biden signed legislation for more than a trillion dollars in spending to improve the nation's infrastructure. Biden's bill was supported by all but six Democrats and 32 Republicans. The legislation provides money to modernize American roads, railroads, bridges, ports, and airports provide wider broadband internet access, and upgrade the electricity and water grid, among other things. It comes as Democrats are debating how and whether to spend nearly $2 billion to provide a wider social safety net. All this after trillions of dollars in COVID relief spending, add supply chain disruptions because of the pandemic, and U.S. consumers are experiencing inflation of prices not seen since 1990. VOA's Michelle Quinn gets us started on the economic tangle the pandemic has wrought. Groceries, gas, cars, even houses. Consumers are paying more as the U.S. economy tries to emerge from the coronavirus pandemic. Well, inflation is high and it's affecting Americans in their pocketbook and their outlook. The Biden administration says higher costs are due to struggles to get people back to work amid the pandemic. The situation, the White House says, underscores the need for passage of the Democrats' nearly $2 trillion social spending package that includes climate initiatives. We want to improve the productive capacity of our economy, which will actually reduce price pressures. We want to get more people to work, which will actually reduce price pressures. Republican leaders who oppose the spending package say it is too costly and will only fuel inflation. The reason I think prices are going to go way up is because of some of the things that they have put into the bill on energy and on climate, which are going to raise energy costs considerably in the year ahead at a time when the American people are already paying sky high prices to heat their homes, to drive their cars, to buy groceries. Economic discontent is fueling some people's frustrations with Biden. Only 39 percent of Americans approve of how the president is handling the economy according to a recent Washington Post ABC News poll. Michelle Quinn, VOA News. If not for several government relief programs, millions more Americans would have fallen into poverty last year. Programs ranging from stimulus checks to a ban on evictions helped many Americans weather the pandemic's economic impact. VOA's Veronica Balderas Iglesias shows us how these government lifelines have kept many American families afloat. I purchased uniform shorts, shirt, shoes, belt, and pants. Natalia Walker's family is one of more than 30 million American households receiving a monthly expanded child tax credit. The single mother of two has been spending the $300 a month of direct payments for school supplies. It was a blessing because I, I wasn't expecting it. Last year, COVID-19 forced Walker to close her cleaning business. She worked whenever she could and relied on local charities and federal income support, such as the stimulus checks aimed at helping struggling households during the pandemic. Well, of course I put some in the savings. Um, I had started, you know, putting more into my business 
and then I had got started another business for my oldest son. So I was just pretty much investing in my boys. New data from the U.S. Census Bureau, analyzed by several researchers, show Natalia's family hasn't been the only one benefiting from a series of recent economic relief measures. The Census Bureau found the poverty rate fell to 9.1 percent from 11.8 percent in 2019. 11.7 million Americans would have been counted as poor in 2020, if not for the stimulus payments. It was about a million white, white children protected from poverty. Without the stimulus payments, the poverty rate for Latino and Black children would have been 6.8 percentage points higher than it was with the, um, with the payments. In terms of the full anti-poverty effect of the child tax credit under the expansion, that won't be seen actually till 2021. Right now, um, it, it seems to have reduced poverty by about a quarter, about 25 percent. While the delivery of stimulus checks has ceased, there's a debate in Congress over whether to extend the child tax credit under which parameters and for how long. Poverty studies expert Angela Rashidi worries that the tax credit will take away the incentive for people to work. She also is bothered by the program's large price tag. The cost of expanding uh, this tax credit to households with children is over $100 billion a year. I think the real question is how do we continue those type of safety net programs that help people but also ensure that they are able to make success for their own families. Nobody's getting rich off of a child tax credit. Jennifer Lassiter Smith is the director for U.S. programs for InMed, a humanitarian development organization serving over 7,000 low-income families in Northern Virginia. It's a fallacy, I think, to think that there's this mass horde of people that are, that are sucking off the government dime. One thing I've seen during the pandemic is sometimes you just need a little bit. We can give someone $500 to help with rental assistance, and that's the difference between their family becoming homeless. And when that happens, it's a terrible slide. You know, so helping people maintain the level is just the best thing that we can do. Natalia Walker says she is determined to continue working hard to keep her family out of poverty. She receives different levels of support from the local nonprofit Lift DC. But she would also welcome having continuous access to enhanced government aid, including the expanded child tax credit, so she can invest in her son's future. I don't live beyond my means. Anything that I pretty much have got, I've either worked for it, or I found a resource, or I got it for free. So I utilize every resource that, that comes my way for me and my family. So I hope and pray that it will last up until 2025, if not permanent. Veronica Valderas Iglesias for VOA News, Washington. Bitcoin, cyber cash, cryptocurrency, the future of finance may lie in the digital world. Communities trying to jumpstart their pandemic-damaged economies see digital currency as emerging as a preferred method for peer-to-peer -peer transactions. VOA's Lenny Ruvaga explains how going cashless is boosting business in Kenya. Tony Mongero, the CEO of Healthland Spa, he has been a pioneer in accepting cryptocurrencies as payment for services for five years. On average, his services cost about $30 and can be paid for using Bitcoin, a decentralized digital currency. He says it's proven to be a popular form of payment. Many customers have also seen that we are accepting Bitcoin, which is a modern form of payment, and they've decided when, when do they come, they can enjoy our massage services and pay using Bitcoin because it's safe, secure, and also very con convenient. A recently released report by Chain Analysis ranks Kenya as a leader in peer-to-peer -peer trading of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. The Global Crypto Adoption Index takes into account the number of cryptocurrency deposits and internet users. 
David Gitonga is the co-founder of Bitcoin KE, a three-year-old organization whose main goal is to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer trading, and that includes educating users on blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin KE says on average it brings around 70,000 visitors to its platform daily. Gitonga says many enjoy the peer-to-peer -peer trading. In Kenya, peer-to-peer uh, -peer is actually the easiest way for people to get into cryptocurrencies. So right now, there are no centralized exchanges, so p most people opt um, So most people opt to go the peer-to-peer -peer way. So these exchanges are not controlled uh, locally, for example, they cannot be shut down. So it's much easier for people to just transact uh, between each other. Michael Kimani is a blockchain analyst from PESA Africa, an organization that monitors cryptocurrencies worldwide with a focus on Africa. Kimani says that the fact that cryptocurrencies are unregulated by a central authority also pose challenges. The central bank uh, issue that has prevented companies or startups from building in Kenya, so it's made it really difficult for Kenyans to have formal channels of accessing cryptocurrencies. And this has created the proliferation of things like uh, cryptocurrency scams. So one of the reasons the peer-to-peer -peer volumes are going up in Kenya is because there are no formal channels and the only way you can buy is through the peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces and channels. The Central Bank of Kenya has in the past stated that cryptocurrencies are not legal tender in the country. Mongera says he can only hope that his choice to add cryptocurrencies as a means of payment will keep attracting more clientele to his growing business. Lenny Ruvaga for VOA News, Nairobi. Dating back more than 1,000 years, China has been at the forefront of changes in currency. Today, it is hoping to mark another global first, a state-backed digital currency. Before there was money, people used a system of bartering to get what they needed. However, such trades were time-consuming and needed an exact match to work. Enter money. The first types of money were items that had an inherent value to a society. In a leap forward, governments then began to create money that derived its worth not from the object itself, but from society's trust in the government. The Chinese created some of the earliest forms of metal coins at the end of the Stone Age and were the first to introduce paper money around 800 AD. At times throughout history, paper bills have been tied to other objects of value, such as the gold standard in the United States in the early 1900s. Nowadays, almost all money receives its value simply by the faith people have in the government that created it and their willingness to hold the currency for future use. The next reimagination of money is likely an entirely digital one, in which currency is turned into computer code. While it may seem that money is already digital because it can be moved electronically, people can still exchange their savings for physical cash. In an entirely digital money society, that would not be the case. Cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin, offer a glimpse into how digital money could operate However, they exist outside the financial system, whereas a state-backed digital currency would be the pillar of a state's legal tender. While many countries are exploring a state-backed digital currency, China has gone farther than any major economy. The country is well positioned to make quick headway because of the widespread use by its citizens of technology like Alipay and WeChat apps, which make physical cash mostly unneeded. China's central bank has already digitized a portion of the country's currency and has launched trials in several large cities to distribute it. Beijing sees advantages if its central bank can create a digital yuan that is internationally popular, including offsetting global use of the U.S. dollar. At the end of 2020, China's currency made up slightly more than 2% of the world's foreign exchange reserves. The U.S. dollar's share is nearly 60%. The benefits of digital currencies are that they offer faster and cheaper transactions compared to traditional money, as well as greater transparency. They could also give governments real-time macroeconomic data that could allow targeted fiscal policies, but consequently could also allow governments to monitor its people's finances. The collection of such data has raised concerns that China could use it to crack down on the financial accounts of human rights activists, as well as persecuted groups such as the Uyghurs. 
The digital yuan could also give people ways to exchange money without needing SWIFT, a widely used system underpinning international money transfers, potentially making it easier to evade sanctions by the United States or other countries. The United States has become increasingly interested in developing a digital dollar. Members of Congress asked Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen about it in early 2021. Powell said digitizing the American dollar is a high priority project. From transit delays to shipping backlogs across ports, the pandemic is being felt at every level across the global supply chain. That's only expected to worsen as the winter holidays approach. Thomas Goldsby is a professor of supply chain management and logistics at the University of Tennessee. In a conversation with the Inside Stories' Elizabeth Cherniff, he discussed the current state of the world's supply chains and how long-term investments can help strengthen them in years to come. How much of the inflation being experienced in the United States can be attributed to the current supply chain disruptions that we're seeing? I think that a fair share of the inflation is attributed to what we're experiencing in our supply chains. After all, everything that we use, consume, or experience is brought to us via the supply chain. So if you think about that complex network of companies that works to provide us with those products and services, uh, they're all experiencing some share of inflation and they're still trying to squeeze out some margins to satisfy their shareholders. And so uh, what you can expect is that there's some uh, effort to try to pass those costs along through the chain and ultimately it's going to land with us consumers. Do you think COVID-19, did it break the supply chain or did it push these already exposed fissures really to the brink? Certainly, the pandemic has presented vulnerabilities and exacerbated them, made them far worse. And, and it's true in both in terms of supply and demand. Uh, and let's just speak of the supply and the supply chain itself that, you know, I was really pleased to see that we're making investments in our infrastructure here in the United States and, and, and trying to close the gap, in fact, with infrastructures found in other developed countries. And that's going to be very helpful. Of course, that's going to take some time for us to catch up and become as capable as we should be. But our, our supply chains have been quite vulnerable for some time and, and our infrastructure weaknesses have not helped. And then when we look at the surge in demand that we've witnessed for goods over the course of this pandemic, that has just taken supply chains beyond the brink. Our supply chains are able to flex somewhat, but not to the extent that the demands have placed upon them. And so if you think about how the typical person spends money in the course of a day or week or year, it's a wide assortment of pursuits. It is the purchase of goods, certainly, but also services and experiences. And I don't know about you, but I've been experiencing far few services, far fewer services and experiences uh, throughout the course of the pandemic. And so what I've done, like many other people, is I've shifted my consumption to goods, and that's just overburdened the system. Do you see any immediate steps that that could be taken or that you feel need to be taken to sort of get us back to that pre-COVID time? There are many steps, but none of them are particularly immediate. Uh, they tend to be long-term investments. And unfortunately, the investments and major steps that would have needed to be taken and needed to be taken two, three, four, you know, even 10 years ago in some cases. So uh, again, our supply chains are able to flex somewhat, but unfortunately, many of the overtures that we need to take, take many months, sometimes years, in order to make much difference. I do think it's very encouraging that the world, including our governments, are becoming you know, much more aware of supply chains and how vital they are to supporting our everyday needs. Uh, and I, I hope that the crisis makes everyone more aware of how we need to invest in things that, frankly, are not very exciting. You know, infrastructure investments are not particularly exciting. But meanwhile, we need that infrastructure. And we also need to invest in areas like education and talent development uh, in the world of supply chain management in order to, uh, to meet the needs that we, we expect every day. Looking forward, do you see any technologies on the horizon that you think could help strengthen the supply chains? There's immense discussion around automation in all forms. I think that most people are quite aware of autonomous vehicles. They think of Teslas and, and things like that. But 
much of that same technology is being applied to large diesel tractor trailers, and, and that's very uh, exciting. Uh, however, I'm, I'm not thinking that we're going to see automated tractor trailers in the near future. Even though the technology is advancing very rapidly, I think it's something that is much more immediate is automation in our warehouses. I think you're probably aware of the shortage of talent and labor that we have uh, to, to fulfill orders for uh, businesses as well as us consumers. And I am seeing rapid adoption in autonomous operations, robots in warehouses. Some say that we advanced the adoption of those technologies five to 10 years over the course of this pandemic in, in light of the resurgence in demand, but also the shortage in labor to fulfill those orders. Going a bit bigger picture, should the United States, do you think the United States should be concerned about the investment that China is making um, around the world when it in terms of ports, at railways, highways, and mining to ensure its supply chain. What are your thoughts on that? So if you have a situation where a nation is growing at the rate that China is, uh, they recognize that infrastructure and supply chain competence are keys to supporting that growth. And so they decide as a people to make that investment. Uh, and we have to you know, work the uh, the maneuverings of, of uh, politics and, and government to arrive at the same conclusions. It's, it's certainly going to take much more time and, and, and frankly, uh, deliberation to arrive at a, at a similar outcome. I just don't think it's a fair fight. You know, that said, I, I do see a lot of promise in public-private partnerships where government can work with, with industry. I mean, look what's going on in our exploration of space right now. I think if we could employ that same ingenuity right here on planet Earth, right here in the United States, as an example, I, I think that we could achieve some really great things much faster. Journalists and civilians are playing key roles documenting evidence of war crimes in Syria. A new film explores how the media is exposing rights abuses, attacks, and torture. VOA's Sirwan Kajo tells us more in this week's Press Freedom Spotlight. Bombings, accusations of chemical weapons use, torture, killings. The UN and others accuse President Bashar al-Assad of a long list of crimes in the decade that Syria has been at war. A new film, Bringing Assad to Justice, is highlighting efforts by media and private citizens to collect evidence and demand accountability for those crimes. People need to be made aware that Syria is one of the world's biggest crime scenes, that torture is systematic, disappearances continue, hundreds of thousands have already been victims of these notorious crimes, as well as arbitrary killing. Syria ranks as one of the worst countries for securing justice in attacks on the media, says the Committee to Protect Journalists. Among the victims, American correspondent Marie Colvin and French photojournalist Remy Oshlik. They were killed and British photojournalist Paul Conroy was critically wounded when Syrian forces bombed their makeshift media center in Homs in 2012. Conroy is acutely aware of the role local media played as Syria became more dangerous. The city got very difficult for, for Western journalists to enter, you know, certainly after ISIS came up, but after Marie was killed, and that, that was almost a turning point where we really had to, we, we had to depend, and we have depended on local Syrian journalists who paid a, a, a terrible price in deaths and disappearances. Assad denies war crimes, but in 2019, a U.S. court found the Syrian government responsible in the murder of Colvin, ordering it to pay $300 million in punitive damages. The case included evidence collected by Syrian and Western journalists. Filmmaker Tynan said much of the archival footage used in the film was produced by Conroy and citizen journalists in Syria. These people are not just media workers. They are human rights defenders in the truest sense of that word. And without them, we would not have the evidence we have today against for crimes against humanity in Syria. And as Syrians demand justice for the war's victims, the filmmakers hope their documentary and the evidence they gathered will go some way to achieving accountability. Sirwan Kejo, VOA News, Washington.
That's all we have for now. Stay up to date at voanews.com and connect with us at VOA News on Instagram and Facebook. I'm on Twitter at KGYP, that's K-G-Y-P. See you next week for the Inside Story.